Welcome to Bob's Last Marathon, where Lena Chow Kuhar shares her first-hand experiences and practical wisdom gained from caring for her husband, Bob, on their long, unmapped journey with Alzheimer's disease. Through her own insights, as well as those of other caregivers, advocates, and experts, Lena hopes to help you meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease and give your loved ones the best quality of life possible. Hearing news about a diagnosis for ourselves or our loved ones can be a devastating, confusing, and difficult experience. To help our listeners find a way to some helpful information and look for guidance on getting started, We've curated content from past episodes that our audience has found to be the most useful. This first section talks about the five key elements of dementia care. It was the fall of 2013, a year after Bob was diagnosed. I just started coming to terms with his illness. We had gotten a few things into motion, a support group, and connecting with the Alzheimer's Association. And we were trying to figure out what lay ahead. A routine trip to visit my daughter led us to Dr. Arnold, at that time the director of the Penn Memory Center in Philadelphia. What Dr. Arnold said to me that afternoon would inform every single decision I made for Bob, giving me the most valuable gift, a framework for caring for him. After listening to my barrage of questions, Dr. Arnold explained to me that there were five key elements of dementia care to keep in mind as I made choices to give Bob the best quality of life for the longest time possible. I don't know if I wrote them down, but from that point on, not a day went by without my thinking about them. As Dr. Arnold explained it, the five key elements to keep in mind are medication, diet, exercise, social interaction, and cognitive therapy. It seems so simple, but in a world that felt like it was crumbling beneath my feet, the five elements helped keep me grounded. Over time, I learned that they overlapped. Managing one element often had a positive effect on others. The mention of medication brought up something that I've learned in my years in healthcare communications, that following a drug regimen is critical. Drugs don't work unless they're taken. To ensure that happens, there usually comes a time when caregivers need to take over. In addition to two medications for Alzheimer's, Bob was taking medications for other health problems. So it was especially important that I take ownership of his medications, make sure they were taken as instructed, that the refills were ordered in time so there were no disruptions. Fortunately, it was early enough in the course of his disease that we could discuss it, and Bob was an easygoing person, so he happily allowed me to take over, which was kind of the dynamic of our relationship anyway. As runners, Bob and I were fairly conscious about what we ate, so we wondered whether a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease would call for a change in our diet. Dr. Arnold recommended the Mediterranean diet, which is well known for its heart-healthy benefits. There's also some evidence it can help stave off Alzheimer's-related changes to the brain. Bob and I were already big fans of fish and vegetables. So it wasn't a big leap to cook with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean protein, the staples of the Mediterranean diet. One of our biggest challenges was cutting down on carbohydrates, pasta, bread, potatoes. So yes, we cheated a little here and there. Life with Alzheimer's 
is tough enough without the occasional guilty pleasure, which for Bob was bread and cereal, and for me, ice cream. Dr. Arno didn't need to preach the benefits of exercise to Bob and me. Since we were runners, it was central to our routine. But when I learned it was important to the health of a person with dementia, I realized that I would need to consciously continue to make exercise a part of Bob's daily activities. In Bob's case, vascular dementia contributed to a loss of coordination and fluidity in his movements. Eventually, his gait became awkward, and I could see in his eyes that walking took some determination. But we discovered different ways to make exercise work. We introduced a walker. I remember him stepping away from his walker momentarily to shoot hoops. To maintain muscle tone, Bob lifted weights and continued doing push-ups, but modified to do while standing up. I also found that very often, exercise means interacting with other people, walking, dancing in a group, working out in a group, rather than isolation. The day before he passed away, Bob was doing hand weights in his wheelchair. By that time, he was no longer able to walk on his own. I found it comforting to feel his strong grip and to see the inevitable smile when he was up and about, exercising at the level that he could. Next on the list of five key elements was social interaction which benefits Alzheimer's patients by keeping the mind active. I remember other caregivers and support groups talking about needing to keep their loved ones at home full-time for the best care. What they didn't realize was that they were depriving the loved ones of social interactions, to say nothing of depriving themselves of a break, which is so important but often overlooked. Knowing the importance of social interaction, both personally and for his disease, helped me make the decision to enroll Bob in a daycare program, even when he was still largely independent. Sure enough, Bob became one of the best-liked members of his daycare program. At first, he would hang around a coffee pot and chat. Later, I would find him clapping enthusiastically when someone told a story. Or, later still, he might wake up from his snooze, as he called it, when people started music or games. The fifth key element, cognitive therapy or cognitive training, was actually one issue on my mind before we saw Dr. Arnold. I first heard about it through the Alzheimer's Association and was considering in-home programs offered by a group in our neighborhood. We opted for in-home cognitive therapy, but as I learned, many adult daycare programs include some form of cognitive therapy. Not to be confused with cognitive behavioral therapy, a type of psychotherapy, Cognitive therapy focuses on improving cognitive skills, such as thinking, concentration, language, and memory. It's a kind of exercise therapy for the brain. Twice a week, in 75-minute sessions, a trained cognitive interventionist would engage Bob in conversation, encourage him to tell stories, work on puzzles, solve math problems, and play games on an iPad. Often, as a warm-up, the interventionist would go for a walk with Bob. His monthly progress was tracked by his ability to engage and focus, as well as overall cognitive skills. As Bob's Alzheimer's progressed and solving math and picture puzzles became too difficult, 
therapy shifted toward art and music. Even the week before he passed away, when Bob was physically too weak to go to daycare, he completed a painting with the supervision of his art therapist. A piece of art that graces the entry hall of my home now. One of the first steps we can take is to think about our lifestyle and what we can do to stay healthy. Dr. Stephen E. Arnold talks about lifestyle practices he recommends for Alzheimer's patients at the time of diagnosis. Recommendations. That can also benefit the health and well-being of family members by reducing the risk of developing the disease. Dr. Arno is professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, and translational neurology head, and managing director of the interdisciplinary brain center at Massachusetts General Hospital. As a physician specializing in memory disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, for over 30 years, I've come to appreciate how many different ways the disease expresses itself, and the many unique ways patients and family experience their journeys. But with all these differences, when families first hear the diagnosis, the spoken or unspoken question is the same: What does the future hold? I answer that regardless of the type of neurodegenerative disease your loved one may have. Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia related to Parkinson's, or frontotemporal dementias, to name a few, you can expect the disease to progress. Over time, these brain diseases erode a person's life, their ability to think, remember, communicate, and care for themselves. The deterioration is often slow and subtle at first, and people can live a good quality life for some time, even with memory loss. But it does progress, and abilities that give us independence worsen. A heart-wrenching point of progression arrives when a person no longer recognizes their spouse, children, or other loved ones. Ultimately, the brain degenerates and fails to the point that the person can no longer feed themselves, maintain bladder or bowel continence, talk or walk. When people ask what exactly kills you with Alzheimer's disease. If it's not another illness like a heart attack or cancer, it's usually a complication of basic functions—a urine infection that spreads to the blood, for example, or swallowing difficulties where the food goes down the wrong pipe, leading to aspiration pneumonia. In terms of life expectancy, rough statistics estimate seven to ten years from the time of initial symptoms, but I've given up trying to predict for any individual. I've diagnosed people when they were still working, and then just two years later, they needed round-the-clock nursing care. On the other hand, I've seen people golfing and going on family vacations 15 to 20 years after diagnosis. At diagnosis, people are eager for a prescription, something to slow or stop Alzheimer's in its tracks. Unfortunately, current medical treatment only offers some very modest benefit, and while the research is very promising, we aren't there yet. While I can't offer a cure, I strongly emphasize common sense lifestyle practices that benefit any individual, but are particularly important for people with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. Cardiovascular health is key. High blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol promote vascular disease and afflict many people in the general population. But they're also associated with Alzheimer's and most types of dementias. So it's important to keep in close contact with your primary care physician to manage these risk factors. On a similar note, exercise is important. There's been a lot of compelling research about how a sedentary lifestyle sets us up and promotes dementia later in life. Physical inactivity, weight gain, and obesity in midlife, and loss of muscle mass in later life are all associated with earlier age of onset and more rapid progression of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Any investment in physical and aerobic activity pays huge dividends in brain health and resilience to dementia. Do what feels right for you. 
If you are pretty sedentary, it could be spending more time on your feet moving about the house, gardening, or walking in the neighborhood. It could involve more focused activities like group class, exercises, dance, or running. Whatever works for you, the more you get your blood pumping, the better. Diet can play a key role in the care of Alzheimer's patients. The Mediterranean or DASH diet is for many of us a manageable way to eat healthy. This diet has plenty of variety with an emphasis on lots of fresh, colorful vegetables and fruits, whole grains and beans, nuts, healthy fats or oils like extra virgin olive oil, fish, occasional low-fat meats like chicken, limited dairy, only very occasional red meat, an occasional glass of wine, not more than one a day, and avoiding highly processed foods, refined sugars and carbohydrates, and salty foods. When you apply these guidelines, you're covering your bases by lowering the risk not only of Alzheimer's, but many other chronic diseases. And it's very likely you're slowing the progression of Alzheimer's. I'm sometimes asked about the effects of other diets like vegan, keto, and paleo on Alzheimer's disease, and I say the data aren't there yet to say one is better than another. None has proved any more beneficial than the Mediterranean diet. Don't underestimate the importance of sleep. Recently, there's been lots of fascinating research showing that harmful amyloid proteins and other metabolic waste products of the brain are cleared during deeper stages of sleep. Getting enough deep stage sleep can be a challenge for older people in general and those with Alzheimer's disease in particular, whose sleep tends to be more fragmented. Sleep specialists, however, offer many recommendations to improve sleep hygiene. Consider your sleep environment. Make sure your bedroom is quiet, dark, and cool enough for comfortable sleep. Also avoid the stimulation of TV, radio, music, and blue light emitting screens right before sleep. Get your body in the habit of a natural sleep rhythm by adjusting your sleep schedule. Try to go to bed around the same time every night and get up at about the same time every morning. Get your body in the mood for sleep. This means avoiding taxing situations, or in the case of caregivers, stressful tasks and work before bedtime to let our minds calm down. It also means not overeating near bedtime, relegating caffeine to early in the day, and avoiding nightcaps since alcohol does disrupt sleep. Many people take antihistamines like diphenhydramine, found in Tylenol PM and other over-the-counter sleep medicines. While they may make you sleepy, they have side effects on other brain chemicals that worsen memory and concentration abilities and should be avoided. Stress, mood, and anxiety. This is a complicated area. There's evidence that people who tend to experience more psychological distress in their day-to-day -day lives have a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and have a faster rate of progression once they do. We all have stress in our lives, Regardless of whether the amount of stress is normal or excessive, it's how we manage it that is important. Some stress is actually stimulating to the brain. Too much or mismanaged stress is destructive. Chronic stress has a wear and tear effect on the connections of the brain, making them more vulnerable to diseases like Alzheimer's. Time for relaxation, practicing meditation, mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, walks in the neighborhood, or just enjoyment of leisure activities should be built into the day. But when stress becomes overwhelming, or when depression and anxiety take hold, it's important to get professional help with either counseling or medicine or both. I'm speaking here of the caregiver as well. Cognitive stimulation is important. I'm often asked about specific brain exercises to improve memory or other cognitive abilities. I don't think that the data on brain training are good enough yet to recommend any specific exercises. However, we do know that lack of mental stimulation may be harmful by making the brain less able to compensate for the disease changes that happen in the Alzheimer's brain. It's helpful to stay intellectually engaged with mind-stimulating activities. Consider ways to keep the mind alive and working. 
Depending on capability, this might involve volunteer work, promoting new experiences in travel, day trips, museum visits, or just reading. Choose engaging TV shows, do crossword puzzles and word searches, and play games that involve strategy. Social interaction can be seen as a form of cognitive stimulation. There is nothing more stimulating to the brain than exchanging ideas and emotions with other people. We are, after all, social creatures. Our brains are hardwired for relationships and thrive on interaction. But as people age, they may retire from work and lose those built-in workplace interactions. Friends and family members die. Arthritis and other physical ailments may make it harder to get out of the house and socialize. As their worlds shrink, people lose the mental stimulation of being with other people, hearing about new things and communicating their own ideas. Isolation can also lead to loneliness and depression, and these conditions are toxic to the brain. On a related note, we're starting to recognize the role of hearing loss in cognitive decline. If you think about it, our ears are perhaps even more important than our eyes as a conduit to the world, especially the social world. With hearing loss, less information is reaching the brain, making it harder to register in memory. Older people who develop hearing impairments have more difficulty understanding and remembering and may become more withdrawn. It's wise to get tested and get hearing aids. Cardiovascular health, diet, cognitive stimulation, sleep, and social interaction. They're important for both the person suffering cognitive decline and the caregiver to help improve quality of life and reduce the risk of disease. These lifestyle improvements do double duty by slowing disease progression while helping to keep the healthy mind healthy for as long as possible. The journey ahead is a challenging one. We'd like to close this episode with some reflections. Is it worth it? As I give testimony to my journey with Bob, the answer is a resounding yes. Amy Bloom's much-publicized book, In Love, and her story about her and her husband's decision to end his life following the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease shocked, saddened, bewildered, and disturbed me. Images from the years following my own husband Bob's diagnosis, the long, unpredictable journey, punctuated by anguish and despair at times, and unexpected calm and joy at others, flash before my eyes, as I realize that I would not trade our times together for anything. While I would not think of those years as the best years of our lives together, we shared magnificent moments feeling the deep love we had for each other, the pride in our children and grandchildren as they rallied and gave us their unconditional support, and our gratitude for all the people who made this journey possible, the clinical team, the home care staff, the social workers, the music, art, speech, physical and cognitive therapists, exercise instructors, drivers, and friends. If there is one thing I want the world to know, it is that an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis does not need to spell an end to quality living, and that help and support are out there for those of us who choose to meet the challenge. So how did we do it? How did we live the Alzheimer's journey through all the heartbreaks? It took us a little while, perhaps a few months, but our first step was recognizing and acknowledging the diagnosis. When we finally came to terms with it, when we signed up for a six-week support program for newly diagnosed patients, I remember saying to Bob, we start our Alzheimer's support group next week. The key word is Alzheimer's. This is your diagnosis. This is what we're going to face together, the biggest challenge in our lives. It's going to be tough, but we can do it. 
Just a few days before that, I had visited our local senior community center, Avenidas in Palo Alto, California, where we lived, and spoken to Vicky, a social worker familiar with the issues of living with dementia. And it was Vicky who recommended the support group and reserved places for us. The group gave us an opportunity to meet people like us, to share our feelings of dismay and confusion, gather information about what lay ahead, and ask the inevitable question, what do we do now? I found the experience of talking to others like us both encouraging and educational, and the extrovert in Bob enjoyed meeting people and chatting with them. We ended up attending support groups pretty much through all the years of his illness. All the support groups we attended were free of charge, run by the Alzheimer's Association. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, many support groups have been available online, making participation easy. Vicky also recommended a care manager, sometimes called a case manager. The care manager is someone experienced in guiding families as they face the challenges of dementia, elder care, or serious illness. Following an initial assessment of our situation, Bob's diagnosis, my employment status, access to family members who could help, our lifestyle and finances, our care manager gave me an overview of what lay ahead in terms of caregiving needs, which would surely increase with cognitive decline. She talked about resources available in our area, such as daycare, and longer-term needs, such as advanced health directives and estate planning. Care managers are consultants, paid by the hour, so I made sure I planned how I would use her time based on our budget as well as our needs. Over the years, our care manager was my sounding board on decisions, such as starting daycare, choosing daycare, and weighing the trade-offs of moving Bob to a care facility or keeping him at home. She also interviewed potential home care staff and guided me in training them. At my request, she would visit the daycare center to observe Bob something only professionals are permitted to do, and report on his progress to me. Key to keeping Bob healthy and feeling well physically was the clinical team. Bob had an excellent primary care physician who had known him for 20 years before the diagnosis. And Dr. Mebbing was there every step of the way to direct and coordinate his overall care. I especially appreciated his readiness to respect and support Bob's neurologist's decisions. With my consent, we tried, successfully I might add, to include experimental approaches to Bob's treatment. This was possible even though Bob's neurologist was in a different healthcare system 3,000 miles away. In turn, Dr. Arnold Bob's neurologist gently reminded me when the time came that he had done everything he could for Bob and that Bob's primary care physician was my most important resource for Bob's care going forward. Dr. Arno also introduced to me what became a guidepost, the five key elements of dementia care, medication, diet, exercise, social interaction, cognitive therapy. I lived by these five key elements as I made decisions for Bob every day. All of this, healthy daily routines, participating in support groups, making sure Bob received the best care possible, would have been far more difficult if I hadn't been at my best physically and mentally. I became a champion of self-care, knowing in my heart that the time I invested in staying well was time well spent for me and for Bob. I made exercise, 
time for myself, music, hiking, and enjoying my grandchildren the highest priority. Putting ourselves first is especially challenging for caregivers because of the incessant and often unpredictable demands of dementia, but it makes all the difference. In our roles as wife and mother, women like me are used to making sacrifices for our family, giving priority to their needs. And then there are practical barriers, such as having people to help with care while we take time off. Recently, Bob's Last Marathon devoted a podcast to the topic of overcoming barriers to self-care. In that podcast, Dr. Barry Jacobs, noted psychologist and family therapist, and Felicia Greenfield, executive director of the Penn Memory Center, offer suggestions on asking for and getting help, and importantly, adjusting our mindset to give self-care the time and space it needs. I am glad the option to end Bob's life never entered our heads as we grieved over the news of his diagnosis, and that I am here today to give testimony to the life and love that are possible for people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Was that worth it? The hard work? The sadness as Bob suffered a never-ending loss? And the reality that the partnership we enjoyed as a couple had evolved into a caregiver-dependent relationship? My answer is a resounding yes. I know from the smiling face of Bob in a photo taken during his orientation at daycare, with tussled hair and a handwritten name tag. I know from the paintings hanging in my home by Bob and our grandchildren as they shared moments of connectedness. In my mind's eye, I can see Bob sitting on our front porch with each of his children as they shared stories or just watch the world go by. And I know from the last few words that remained in his vocabulary to the end. Thank you, I love you, and you take good care of me. Thank you for listening to Bob's Last Marathon. Transcripts of today's show and other episodes and acknowledgements can be found at bobsmarathon.com. That's Bob's Marathon without an apostrophe. Send us a note with your comments. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We wish you and your loved ones good health.